It is time to get down to business. Do you know who this is? Uh, la cucaracha? This is Queen Elizabeth, ruler of England. Oh, I love England. The music, the fashion. I'm seriously thinking about overthrowing it someday. <gasps> anyway, this pale drink of water oversees it all. I'm her biggest fan, love her work, and I really, really, really want her crown. <laughs> Steal me the crown and all your dreams come true. Respect, power. Banana. Banana. And that is just the briefest of clips, of course, from Minions. It's directed, co-directed by Pierre Coffin and Kyle Boulder, who join us now. Hello, guys. Hey, hello. Before we go any further, I just want to play you uh, part of what we said about Despicable Me 2. Here's Mark. And the thing I laughed at most is that they've increased the role of the minions from the first film, because the minions kind of, you know... Who are the minions? The minions are those sort of little yellow weebly things that are invented to do the work of their master, and they speak in this strange... The, um, the Oompa Loompas, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, OK, okay fine. They like the Oompa Loompas, and they speak in this sort of babblesome gobbledygook, which sounds like it's somewhere between French and Japanese, and co-voiced instantly by the co-directors. And uh, in the first movie, they, they're sort of, you know, secondary characters. They, were, they weren't actually part of the, of the, the story in the original pitch in this they've just said you know everyone really finds them funny in the same way that scrat was always the funniest thing about ice age these out scrat scrat the stuff with the minions is properly laugh out loud funny there's it's kind of slapstick humor that on the one hand owes a debt to silent cinema which so much slapstick humor does on the other hand because they're doing this kind of babblesome you know gobbledygook speak it there's i'll give you an example of one one of the characters is introduced he says my name is mr ramsbottom and one of the minions goes bottom and, and i started laughing and i must have laughed for about five minutes at the sound of this little yellow weeble do and i i have to say pierre and carl <laughs> after mark did that as as the review bottom was one of the most frequently occurring words on the program um, what do you think of what Mark said? Because the 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 key bits there, I think, for for anyone who's gone to see uh, Minions, certainly a silent movie and certainly slapstick. Because whatever it is you you were doing in Despicable Me Two, it's it's there and then some more in Minions. Well, the the thing about animated features is all about giving tributes to all these guys who managed to express themselves without words, and uh, the Minions are. Uh, a, typical example of that just because like they don't have a well they have a language of their own but you don't really understand the words you understand the intent uh, so you rely on on the uh, mel melodic quality of a sentence to know exactly what a character thinks or what he's going through emotionally like anger or telling a joke or something and physical comedy which you know Chaplin and even closer to us Mr. Bean have been like you know uh, our, our constant reference for us. And ju just on that language, as you as you mentioned, Pierre, about the the melodic quality of how the minions speak, it is extraordinary how many. I mean, anyone listening will be picking up. I mean, Mark mentioned Japanese, uh, and I think your mother was uh, Indonesian, an Indonesian novelist. So there's some of that in there. There's, I think, the whole rhythm is is very French, but there's English words in there. I mean, how did you construct, if indeed you did construct? Uh, the sentences and the language that they use. Man, I wish I could tell you I did construct, I did write like a, a grammar book about it, a lexic and stuff like that, but uh, that would make me sound very intelligent. But I can't really say that was all planned, just because in the first Despicable movie, they were all basically saying gibberish stuff, and except for a few words like that came out and that meant something. Uh, in the second movie, as they became central, as Mark was saying, uh, I needed to, to have a little bit more <laughs> words uh, to, to carry, like, you know, a little bit more of the story. And uh, again, uh, in, the, in the, the, this prequel that we've just done, uh, that's the way they call yes. it over there across the Atlantic, um, we, we, I, I needed even further more language just because there were so many to voice. And the beauty of it, actually, but really after the fact that that's got to stay between you and me, uh, is that we sort of stayed in that movie that the minions have been here forever uh, and that they've served all these different 
masters across the globe, uh, which now <laughs> gives a certain meaning to the, the reason why they talk that way. You know, mix a mix of Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Italian, Spanish words, French in there. Mm. Uh, so it makes you know, they, it it makes us look like very intelligent now. Mm. I think. Just to be clear, Pierre, all the minion voices are you, all of them are you. Yeah. I'm afraid so. <laughs> Would it make it easier to have other minion voices? Or are you quite happy voicing everybody? I, I I thought it befell on me to do them just because I I, I have no clue. But I I was sort of forced in, or cornered into that spot by most of my animators who who wanted to animate on top of my voice for some reason because. I'm, I'm not sure I have a French accent. Uh, I have a tendency, like when I say Spanish, wish to, to, to roll the R's and stuff like that. So it, it, it made for that weird accent that wasn't really ident identifiable, I think. But you do, you do a fair amount of like playing the different characters so that they, they don't sound exactly the, the same. Yeah, I, I try to. I don't know if I, you know, I'm a very bad judge at what I do. So, so, what, so, so the, the, the three main minions are Kevin, Bob and Stuart. So the difference in their three voices and the difference in their characters, Pierre? Uh, the, 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 in terms of voices, well, it, it was all led by character, actually, because Kevin is supposed to be this, the, the conscience, uh, the, the serious one of the three. Uh, he's the leader, basically. Uh, Stuart, uh, so he, he had to have this voice slightly deeper uh, than the two other ones just to carry out this, this impression of seriousness i guess uh stewart was is uh, is a character that's a little bit more laid back he's the teen i would say of the bunch he's a slacker he doesn't want to do anything but he does love you know uh, bringing attention to himself uh so he's actually my normal voice i would say <laughs> and and as for bob he's the innocent one the uh the naive one he's the one that's carrying out like most of the emotion of the movie and he's 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 voiced in a slightly higher pitched yeah. uh uh tone Kyle, uh, the uh, I said at the beginning that you, you you're the co-directors of this movie. I think people have a general sense of what it means to direct uh, a, a live-action movie. How do you go about directing an animation? Uh, well, the way that I like to think about it um, is that in a live-action film, uh, I always think of like a, li a live band, you know, up on stage and everything's happening at once. You know, the, the crew are all there, the actors are all there, and everything's you know go. Everything has to happen at one time. But animation films are a little bit more like studio musicians, where you have more time to sort of refine things. You try things out. Um, we, we, you know, storyboard the sequences, edit them together, watch them, try to make them more funny. You know, reboard them. You know, so so the process is a process of refinement until we get it, you know, the way that we want it to. Pierre, you mentioned this is a prequel, so it's sort of it's largely set in 1968, which of course gives you lots of wonderful. Uh, a great series of hippie jokes and uh, and a one and a wonderful soundtrack. But was that was that was that the sole reason that you picked sixty eight so you could get the get the tunes right? Well, the, the, the audio wise, certainly, and we sort of uh, uh, as filmmakers, we wanted to feel that this was not just a, a prequel. Not it's just that it's. It's really when you work with a big studio that way, uh, like in Universal, and when you're asked to do like, oh, these guys are really funny in those two other movies. Let's make a, a movie out of them. It feels like they want to do it just for the money. <laughs> and the the reason why it sort of interested us is to to make an actual movie. And the reason why it's partly set in '68 also is that we could have like a, a great license. We could make it almost like a timepiece, where. Uh, we could play with the play, obviously, with the music and with the great soundtrack, and play around with soundtracks that are not necessarily mainstream in a way. Like, like when when the idea of using the doors was thrown out, mm. I had like pictures of helicopters shooting people for some reason, and uh, I thought it was a great way to like get that image out of my head. And and hopefully now, when people listen to the doors, they'll see something else than than you know hard stuff. I have my fart gun in front of me, and I just Ooh, want to mention it. Let it go. No, don't shoot it. <laughs> Please. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been, sit it's been sitting in the studio ever since Despicable Me 2, so I thought if I don't use it when Pierre and Carla are on the show talking me, although there is... <laughs> is that actually the gun? Yeah, this is the fart gun. <laughs> are you sure? Yeah. Well, it's it doesn't sound like the fart gun to me. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it's what I, it's, it's got your stamp on it. I'm aware that I've got 20 seconds left um, in which to speak to you, and, I, and we haven't actually mentioned the story of the film. Normally we put this right, right at the very beginning, but in the remaining time that we have together, Pierre and Cal, would you just please tell us what happens in your movie, and then otherwise it would be rather well, the, strange. The, the movie is about um, how the minions want to serve a, a, an evil villain, and it's about their search for that, and and them, you know, f- meeting uh, Scarlet Overkill, which is Sandra Bullock's character, and you know, s- sort of getting getting what they wanted, but it turning out to you know, kind of go go downhill from there, and and you know, to see how it all unravels. And again, it's a timepiece, so we we sort of explain where the minions come from, what s- sort of steps they have to go through uh, to to obtain what they want, and they can't get it, but they ultimately they have this vision of maybe oh we're, we've got to work for her uh, Scarlet Overkill which is like brilliantly voiced by Sandra Bullock so it's, it's so that's why the, the core of the movie is actually happening in its 60s and again the part of the core of the movie is actually happening in London also. Yes, that's right. Uh, the, and we should say Her Majesty the Queen gets a, gets a starring role. Um, and, oh, God, yeah. Beautiful uh, role. Uh, and it, and it's, it's hugely enjoyable and beautifully done. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your time, Pierre and Carl. And Despicable Me, Despicable Me 3, I think, is happening. Is that right? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it says here. I was told yes, maybe. <laughs> Does it involve you? Uh, it does, yeah. It, yeah. Does, it involves, it involves uh, both of us. And does it Carl involve... And does it involve <laughs> Any, any of that? <laughs> I don't, who did that? <laughs> Kyle? No? no? I don't know. <laughs> Probably. Maybe. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time, sir. Thank Thanks you. Bye-bye.